Right, so greetings. Hello, it's Dr. Tom Staffern here. Uh, it's my fasting Sunday, as usual, in uh, Betet, the lovely heart of France, basically in the geographical dead centre of France, in a remote little department called La Creuse, which most people have never heard of unless you're French, and even then I think some French people have never heard of it. It's like the back of beyond, but it's actually exquisite. I'm looking out over beautiful uh, fields and skies and sunsets and um, <clears throat> so I send you all greetings. It's the last day of the Tokyo Olympics. The closing ceremony is going on as we speak um, and so congratulations to all the Olympians who've participated um, <clears throat> and I'm speaking also as educational coordinator for the Delphic Games which are friendly rivals and have been for 3,000 years to the Olympic Games. The Delphic Games are about philosophy, spirituality, peace, uh, culture, the arts, music, dance, theatre. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we have our own programme. And so, um, you know, get in touch if you're interested in competing or um, we are looking for another city to maybe put on the Delphic Games when we all come out of lockdown. They have a totally different flavour to the Olympic Games. Um, and there's no kind of uh, monetary nonsense because the Delphic Games, you don't get cash prizes. You get a laurel wreath given by, um, by tradition in ancient Greece at the Delphic Games. They were sacred to the god Apollo and Gaia and to the Nine Muses. So, you know, they're, they're important in their own right. Um, I might mention those later. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's interesting I've discovered this week, I've done a lot of work on, on the history of the Delphic Games, and I discovered there was a tragedy in the 4th century BC when, when the Delphic um, treasury and archives burned down. They lost all their records in a fire, which is horrendous. And my heart goes out to the people of Greece that are now suffering from horrendous fires, um, all over the country in Athens, uh, on the outskirts of Athens, touch wood. You know, it is it is a major problem, and it's not going to go away. This is this is global warming. This is what people have been warning us against for years, and it's why I set up the Global Green University, which I, you know, run, because we have to change the way we think in higher education, um, and and really up our game to solve these problems. Um, <clears throat> The old style university worked hand in glove with the nation state and with the military establishment of that nation state and the legal establishment. So it trained professionals who could go off and win and fight wars better. That's the model in British higher education. It has been for, you know, ever since Henry VIII um, took over the establishment um, <clears throat> in, you know, a sort of intellectual coup, actually. Um, at least in the medieval university before Henry, there was a sense that you're actually doing your work for God. You're trying to find ultimate truth because it's a spiritual duty. In the early medieval universities, there was that sense of great think thinkers like um, Grosteste at Oxford and uh, Roger Bacon and, you know, endless numbers of scholars. that um, They're called the Scholastics, but it's slightly a pejorative name. They were just deep, deep thinkers starting with Abelard and his circle in Paris, here in France, they were, they were trying to find truth because they felt it was an ethical duty. It was there, it was, you know, it, it's, it's what keeps society together. And if we lose sight of that, which in Hindu and Sanskrit terminology is called Dharma, then the whole of society falls apart. And if higher education is co-opted simply to become a mouthpiece for whatever military, you know, intelligence establishment state system is running the country, be it Bolshevik Russia or Hitler's Germany or Stalinist, you know, um, or other kind of totalitarian rule systems, then intellectual freedom goes out the window. There is no intellectual freedom. There's intellectual slavery. So as a rebel against that, I set up a global green university, which is still going, and it's the only well, it's one of the few alternative universities that exist for education for its own sake. If you do a degree with us, if you do a master's or a PhD, then you do it for the love of the learning itself, not for the kudos of having a bit of paper that says you've, you've gained your diploma. 
but the standards we insist on are as rigorous as Oxford University or London. And that, of course, you know, if you're looking just for a cheap little diploma that you can buy on the internet, then go somewhere else. This is a proper university. And um, so <clears throat> what I've learned this, this week uh, about Delphi, which is very interesting to me, is that after their treasury and archive was melted down in a fire, which, you know, I even hear that Olympia itself is now under, under attack from flames, the site of the original Olympic Games. I mean... I just pray and pray that um, these, that Greece can put these fires out and that the world's eco-battalions can, can enlist and, and sort this. I have made a proposal um, that the world's military um, establishments, you know, should, 90% of them should recommit to retooling themselves to become eco-battalions. So they would be involved in things like flood fighting, uh, flood defences, forest fires, um, all all the problems that are arising from global warming. I mean, Siberia's been on fire, for God's sake. Now we have um, prognosis of the, um, you know, the currents in the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf Stream, on which so many people depend, like Scotland and Ireland, depend on that warm water to make it habitable. Well, apparently they're all going to shut down now, possibly. And we've got sea level rises. So... You know, what are, what are the military for? I'm not against soldiers and warriors. I think they're really important. I used to nurse them for a living. I know soldiers. I've met generals. I've worked with generals for peace back in the 80s when we got uh, an end to the Cold War in Europe. Um, and generals for peace, along with my philosophers for peace, put some pressure on the military establishments to go to the, mili go to the political leaders, Reagan and Gorbachev and Thatcher, and say, look, we can't have a Third World War because... It's not like we would win it, or they would win it, or we would lose a few hundred thousand, they would lose a few hundred thousand. No. The planet itself would be in danger because they'd worked out there's this thing called global winter, nuclear winter, that would affect the whole planet. If, if there's a third world nuclear war, and all the bombs are let off, and America and Russia go for it, and China gets involved, and God knows what, you know, Britain starts firing its missiles, and so on and so on, and they all go off in, in about a day, which is what would happen. Um, that's curtains for humanity, because the amount of um, dust and smoke and all the rest that would be woken up by all that would obscure the sun for like about a year. I mean, the figures were, were worked out by scientists. And the crops would fail, uh, because we all depend on the photosynthesis from the sun. Now, if you block out the sun, like imagine it's night time for a whole year. You know, the world as we know it wouldn't survive. And also, not to mention the millions, probably billions of dead if all the cities start going up. What I learned when I lived in Scotland near Faslane, I went to an academic uh, in discussion um, of scholars who went and protested outside Faslane. As an expert in peace studies, I went and protested with them. And we, had, we did papers like it was a conference, right? And one of the papers was brilliant from a guy, I think he was a professor at Leeds, who said that the UK nuclear defence force, which is in these submarines patrolling around in the Atlantic, um, has a whole bunch of missiles on, which are loaded at Faslane, with nuclear bombs that come from Coalport Mountain, which was literally opposite the Castle of the Muses, where I lived for seven years, and ran my peace institute from. So... Each of those missiles <clears throat> is so designed that when it shoots up, so your submarine's underwater, the missile comes up from the under, under the sea, shoots up into the air, reaches a certain height, and then it has 50, 50 independently targetable warheads, each of which is many times bigger than the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima, which destroyed the entire city and killed 100,000 people, 70,000 outright, and then, you know, more than 100,000 taking in all the casualties that died later. Um, so just think about that. So each missile that would be fired from that submarine would would be able to destroy 50 cities, like within an hour um, or so. Um, <clears throat> and I find, I mean, okay, so that's what we're up against with the Third World Nuclear War. And my colleagues in the scientific and medical profession, it was the physicians for um, peace and, and nuclear responsibility, 
went to uh, Gorbachev and Reagan and Thatcher and said, look, these are the facts. This is what happens. This is, this is not negotiable. This isn't like we're not making it up because we're kind of peace campaigners. These are scientific facts of what would happen in a nuclear war exchange. Therefore, we must disarm. We must move this juggernaut of nuclear weaponism, which is a sort of cult, into the direction of, of the port called peace. And, <clears throat> and miraculously, they, they managed to persuade them. And Reagan and Gorbachev signed this this huge reduction of nuclear weapons, Thatcher too, and we breathed a sigh of relief. And in 1990, the world got a um, the Treaty of Paris, which then essentially dismantled that Cold War in Europe. Unfortunately, it didn't it didn't include the Middle East and it didn't include East Asia. So China's continued to ramp up its nuclear forces, North Korea. Um, and, of course, India and Pakistan are still nuclear powers, and Israel, likewise, in, in the Middle East, and all the instability that that causes. So, we are not, we are not home yet. Now, my concern is that the, the, the money that goes into militarism, that sees nuclear war as a good idea that we should invest in, and that Boris Johnson, with his crazy financial elite backers who are lacking in morality, um, want to increase Britain's nuclear weapons fleet, you know, and, and this is just male bravado, this is nonsense, this is ego in a national vein, sort of rule Britannia, which fits with the whole Brexit mentality of, I mean, that's not how nations become great, um, you know, with all due respect. When I last exchanged letters with the Queen, who I have met and conversed with, um, in certain respects, over my Commonwealth Interfaith Network, which I set up as a Canadian. Um, I just <coughs> pointed out, A, Brexit was a catastrophe and she should do something about it. And B, I suggested she go walk about, because the problem with these, these top elite people like the Queen, like her top advisors, uh, is they don't go and meet ordinary people. You know, if the Queen went in disguise, is what I suggested, like King Alfred the Great used to do. He would go around Wessex and meet just ordinary farmers, ordinary working class people, you know, people that were struggling to make a living. And it taught him humility. Whereas I think this lot, the Brexit lot, and I'm sorry, the Queen has to be included in their number. She hasn't stopped it. It means she has deliberately um, enabled it. They have such an arrogance built up. They become so used to their life of perks and, and splendour that... The thought of actually going and talking to ordinary people is just, what? Why would I do that? You know. Well, the reason you should do that is, is, to, is if you care about the people of the country that you supposedly reign over, any decent monarch would, would want to go and meet people in disguise and hear their stories. I mean, of course, the Queen is hard to disguise, but, you know, sort of semi-disguise. Um, and I, I do know people that have met the Queen like that, walking around the streets of Midhurst in Sussex or in a local country park, walking the dogs. And um, I'm sure she's, she is herself, you know, a good person. My problem is it's the bubble in which she lives that is protected from normal people being able to actually interact with her. And if you do that for um, generations, actually, in the case of the royals, then then a certain thinking sets in, which is, ah, Brexit, great idea, get sovereignty back. Ah, more nuclear weapons, oh yeah, great idea, we want to be a great power, yeah, yeah, we want at least ten more submarines. You know, this is the problem. So, I keep coming to the point of then wondering, but let me go back to the fires at Delphi that destroyed their archive. A tragedy... Um, and that's why I'm saying that the military should retool as an ecological emergency fighting force. And I do this on the basis of a brigadier from the Indian Army who once gave a lecture for me at the University of London when I was just setting up my institute back in 1991. And <clears throat> this amazing general, who was friends with General Sapis, run by my colleague Brigadier Harbottle and Russian equivalents and American, um, this general was tasked with running the eco battalion for the um, <clears throat> for the Indian Army, and its mission was what I'm describing. 
Well, I'm saying every every military force in the world should have, <clears throat> like retool, I don't know, a significant percentage of its armed forces to be eco battalions. The models are there; they can copy the Indian thing. And then I've also shared before on this platform that just recently um, at the Belfer Institute at Harvard University, there was a brilliant talk, well, conference actually, by experts in intelligence, largely American, but some British and Russian uh, experts, who were saying that the American intelligence under Biden is now being asked to look at planetary threats to the world, global warming, the main one, and, and what can America do and, and her allies to respond to this? Um, well, you know, I hope they're doing their homework, is all I can say. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, that's, that's what I'm saying about what the fires of Greece, um, what they call us to do. And it's not just Greece, it's Turkey, another country I know and love well. It's Italy, it's Siberia, it's California. Um, you know, we humans have to get real. We're living in an endangered, difficult time. And we have to at least put our weapons of war away. We have to have immediate ceasefire in Afghanistan. We can't afford yet another Taliban-type Talibanization of the country. A million people fleeing out of the country and all the horrors that causes. No, there should be a, um, a UN-led peacekeeping force go in. It was a stupid idea, always was, to send an American-British NATO force in. I mean, that's just... That's just confrontational. I mean, NATO is not a peace force. It should be retooled as such, but it's not at the moment. Uh, no, there should be a proper UN peacekeeping force uh, go in to protect the civilians. And that's what the Afghan intellectuals that I work with have called for. They've issued a declaration which is going out to the world's um, peacekeeping you know, agencies. Um, <clears throat> we can't just sit by and do nothing and watch as the Taliban sweep back into power, because they have a really brutal understanding of, of a pseudo form of Islam, which is about uh, cultural terrorism, actually, um, based on, on poor education and poor studies. You know, these poor people have never had a chance to actually do higher education, Islamic style. Um, I've been fortunate to teach in higher education colleges for Islam, and I know what it is. You know, I know authentic Islamic philosophy when I meet it, and it's not the Taliban. Um, so, so <clears throat> we have a problem. Now, when the Treasury burned down in Delphi all those years ago, who did the Delphians invite to come and rebuild it, other than Aristotle? I mean, it's, it's a fact that's extraordinary, actually. Aristotle was invited uh, with his nephew, who later succeeded him as head of the um, Lyceum, his university and they they were trying to reconstruct what has been destroyed what was in this Delphic treasury what was in this Delphic um, archive and it would have been the records of all the games that had happened before that you know Delphi came into being at least by 1500 BC it was a sacred site it was a temple it was an oracle initially to Gaia which was the primordial mother goddess you know and then when Apollo appeared with the, with the sort of um, uh, new waves of, of Greek immigrants, it became dedicated to Apollo, but it was always secretly to Apollo and Gaia. And the oracle were these women sibyls, or uh, pythonesses, as they were called, who, who were able to tap into the collective unconscious and, and channel forth um, gnomic utterances, which then were interpreted... Um, and it kept going till for over a thousand years, um, up until a fanatical Christian emperor, Theodosius, the ungrate, as I call him, closed it down by order, along with all the pagan shrines and oracles and certain things. You know, it's bonkers. Why would you do that? Well, because you lack proper education, because you've been brought up in a fanatical sect, um, which true Christianity is not. True Christianity of the authentic kind that Jesus taught and his initial disciples, Thomas, John, Mary Magdalene, the initial group who used to go with him to Banyas and, and play the Who Am I game. Um, no, they, they were not idiots. They were not fanatical people. Unfortunately, you see, when it became a state religion, 
the state then gets involved in well, what is authentic, what is allowed, and what is permissible, and what is not. Well, philosophy isn't allowed. <laughs> Paganism isn't allowed. Proper thinking isn't allowed. Shut that lot down. And oracles aren't allowed because that that enables you to talk to the gods. That can't be allowed. Shut that down. So there's this strategy of sort of um, <coughs> closure that happens whenever totalitarian state regimes adopt a particular religion out of the whole panoply that's available. And, you know, my students know that I've created this periodic table of the world's religions to show the entire gamut of all the religions and philosophies that we, we have on this planet. Each child, each student at university and college and, and school should have access to this. And um, <clears throat> it should be on your wall of your department um, of philosophy and religious studies or history if you haven't got one. <clears throat> and, you know, this is our birthright to know all this stuff. It took me 20, 30 years to research all this through endless libraries, studies, teaching, um, you know, book collecting, reading, visiting libraries all over the world, and meeting religious leaders, because I worked as Secretary General for the World Conference on Religion and Peace, which is the largest interfaith peace group still going, now run by a very wise uh, Islamic uh, female professor, a colleague of mine, who's, who's taken on the job from Bill Vendley, my old colleague. So, you know, and um, <clears throat> so... After all those years of research, this is what came out. It includes philosophy, which is down the bottom. And I'll be coming to that in a minute. So I just think that's really interesting that Aristotle was asked to go and, and, and you know, try and re reconstruct what had been burned. I hope to God that archives and so on are not going up in, in Greece today. Um, I mean, it's bad enough the forests around Athens and elsewhere in Greece going up. You know, this is a tragedy for, for anyone that loves culture and European history and civilization as I do. Um, and also in Turkey, which is <clears throat> you know, actually, you know, really very connected uh, culturally. So what am I going to do today? Okay, that's all my little preamble. That's my hello. It's Thomas here. <laughs> um, I'm going to share something about ethics because I think... I think the world is suffering from a, 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 f a blazing flame of lack of ethics. It's not just the forest fires. <laughs> you know, Brexit to me was like, a, like an incendiary device that went off, plotted like deliberately by cynical manipulator types like that Nick's guy that, that ran um, Chris Wiley and the team. I mean, these people are are beyond ethics, they're off the page. They they don't get anywhere on this table. I mean I mean this table doesn't include people that just do sheer evil for the sake of it. That's what those guys were doing. And out of pure ignorance. No, there isn't the box for that. I mean there is a box called Satanism, but that includes people that are actually like believing Satanists like LeVay and have a sort of belief system. Which as far as I know doesn't include deliberately wrecking entire countries. You know, that, that's just off the scale. It's somewhere off here, you know. So, <clears throat> okay, so I think we're suffering from this, this, this catastrophic failure in ethics in British and American society, above all. And, you know, you can pinpoint it, you can argue about, well, it's cutthroat military capitalism, it's Cold War triumphalism that said, we won the Cold War, we do what we want. It's, it's you know, Brexit, Rule Britannia imperialism, uh, as fast, repeating as Marx said, you know, history repeats itself fine as a farce, so this is the farce. Boris Johnson the clown, and then he's backed up by these, these rich billionaires, um, you know, who all jostling for positions in the cabinet, for lordships, for buying up this or that, um, you know, as if it's a sort of petty princeling, like a, like, um, you know, like an oriental despot who can hand out these things. I, Boris Johnson, I mean, obviously he's lost any sense of ethics and never had it, um, never studied it. So, <clears throat> okay, what's the antidote? I'm a philosopher in that Aristotelian medical mode. I'm a healer using reason to, <clears throat> to try and heal this catastrophe. And how can we do that? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to look at ethics and I'm going to share with you some ideas, teachings and thoughts on that. 
I'm going to start by quoting from this book, which, again, some of you are familiar with. This is my study of Philosophiae Religionis Principia Mathematica. This is from volume two. And you'll see the periodic table is on the front. Um, so this is this project that I was inspired to do by Newton's uh, legacy. Newton wrote the Principia Mathematica, great text that revolutionised maths and physics and astronomy, and introduced the concept of gravity as a sort of explanatory tool to explain the motions of not just heavenly bodies, but everything that exists in the universe. It was a tour de force. He was a precocious, slightly self-taught genius, slightly maverick, he didn't call his calculus calculus, he called it fluxions. He worked out the maths, he disputed with Leibniz, he was slightly cantankerous, um, you know, um, and, but he, you know, he was on the side of the angels deep down, and, but he left unfinished the, the question of what causes phenomena in physics, what causes gravity. He said, I don't know, all I know is the maths, I don't know what causes it. Um, but it might have something to do with God and he put that in the final little general scolium as it's called the addendum to his great work so when I read that and mused upon it and I was um, I went for an interview at Cambridge to teach religious studies and philosophy in a, quite a good secondary school um, a couple of years ago and, and you know flew there and, and, and I spent a day in the library where my daughter's doing a PhD bless her and I love Cambridge Library, you know, it's like any spare time I have, I always hit the academic libraries. Um, <clears throat> and there I read the General Sconium and I thought, hmm, maybe we need to do a, a sequel to this Principia Mathematica. I, I don't seem to have small ideas. It's a problem of being, um, for many years, a global intellectual. <clears throat> and so I thought, OK, what I'll do is I'll write the Philosophiae Religionis, Principia Mathematica. His is called the Philosophiae Naturae, or Naturalis um, Principia Mathematica. The, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy is his book. Mine is the Mathematical Principles of Religious Philosophy. And it's, it, by definition, it can't like be the only ever book. I'm just proposing we start a discipline together called Religious Mathematics. Um, and I've written the groundwork, as they say, the Grundwerk in German. And I want to read from chapter 71, which is called Gratitude, Kindness and the Virtues of Religious Mathematics. So this gives you a little glimpse of how I'm approaching the subject. This is the section called Key Thoughts. If religions are any use for anything, it has to be to inculcate in us all a deeper sense of virtue. The philosophical study of virtues as expressed and practised in different religious systems is the field of comparative religious ethics. And philosophers of religion have been discussing and analysing what should be the primary and which the secondary virtues since at least 500 BC onwards. Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics put forward a highly influential theory of virtue ethics and provided a mathematical way to analyse situations and come up with a virtuous response in each case, which was one of the first known attempts to look at virtues mathematically. Confucius, Mencius and other Chinese sages likewise analysed virtues and the I Ching, their oracular framework, provides examples of how the flow of life creates constantly changing situations which test us for our flexibility and tenacity of upholding virtue even in the face of chaos and provocation. The biblical tradition of proverbs and other wisdom writings inculcate the inner cultivation of virtue above all else as the path to wisdom. But how many virtues are there in all languages and religions and philosophical traditions? Are they universal and can they be synthesised to certain fundamental virtues that each religion promulgates? 
Do they have different prioritizations and hierarchies of virtue? Among some of the greatest virtues are truth, honesty, kindness and gratitude. Christ taught as a rabbi the way to achieve happiness based on the practice of the virtues. And theologians eventually came to list seven key virtues that every Christian should strive to practice. Chastity, temperance, charity, diligence, patience, kindness and humility. Buddhism made the practice of the virtues a key part of its spiritual path towards enlightenment. And in the form of the ten paramitas, perfections expected of an aspirant towards bodhisattvahood, they are listed as dharma, generosity, sila, proper conduct, nekama, renunciation, panya, wisdom, viriya, energy, kanti, patience, satcha, honesty, aditana, determination, metta, goodwill, upeka, equanimity. In Jainism also there are ten virtues to be practised. Supreme forgiveness, Supreme humility, supreme straightforwardness, supreme truthfulness, supreme purity, supreme self-restraint, supreme penance, supreme renunciation. Jainism and Buddhism and yoga especially stress ahimsa non-violence, non-harm, as the key to all the other virtues. If we cannot learn to practice non-violence of speech, thought and wisdom, sorry, speech, thought and action, we are not yet fully entered into the spiritual path of wisdom. Modern virtue ethics builds on all these ancient wisdom teachings. Theosophy, Sikhism, Islam, Sufism, Baha'ism, Religious Socialism, Religious Liberalism, Eco-Philosophy, Judaism, etc. All have their own subtle nuances when it comes to the ethics that we need to cultivate now as a planet. Our lists might be different, but most of us will agree on certain basics. Perhaps the mathematical analysis of the religious virtues can help here. If so, how do we go about doing this? How do we develop a comprehensive mathematics of the virtues? So that is what's called the key thoughts and that's part of the chapter. I'm going to come back to that book uh, perhaps at the very end of this talk because I then pose some interesting questions, or I might, you know, intersperse some of those questions as I go on. I'm going to do a few readings now from different philosophers <clears throat> about ethics, because although I'm in the room of literature, um, philosophy and literature are actually quite close. I mean, my passion for literature, I've written, you know, a novel, I'm writing another one at the moment, I've written a thousand poems, I've written and acted in plays, and I'm a literary figure as well as a philosopher, but to me this, the, there's an overlap. What I can put into poetry is often like pure like poetry, is, is philosophy. Um, and sometimes in my philosophical works I will weave in a kind of poetic way of just 